Mike Radich here, and I'm now joined on the phone by former WEC featherweight champion Cole Escovito. Cole, how are you? Not bad, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Sure, no problem. Thanks for doing it. Cole, it's been a while since we've seen you in action back at UFC on Fox, uh, the first UFC on Fox, uh, actually, when Cain Velasquez fought Junior Dos Santos, you were on the undercard. You fought against Alex Caceres in November of 2011, so it's been a really long time since you've been in the cage fighting. I'm just curious, I haven't seen an announcement anywhere. Are you retired from MMA? Um, that's a good question. Everybody keeps asking me that. I haven't really just retired. I kind of just stepped away. Um, I, I've never really been one of those people who thinks I need to make like announcements about my retirement or things like that. I just uh, I just kind of stepped away for a while. Uh, I got a real job doing, you know, I got to wear like a suit and tie and stuff like that to work now. Um, realistically, I just took time away to help other fighters get ready, other guys on our team. Uh, I haven't had the time to commit to regular training, so I haven't really put myself out there to any promoters. Uh, I'm sure if I got a local promoter, it could probably get me, you know, a local fight, be fun, you know, kind of thing. If I got the itch and I wanted to have a bunch of fun with my friend or something and make a big, you know, local thing out of it, I could probably get away with doing something like that. But as of now, I haven't really been actively speaking anything, but I haven't really just flat out retired either, I guess. So uh, it, it's kind of one of those in limbo things, I guess. Right. So you're saying there's a chance. Um, yeah, I'll, we'll go with the uh, something about Mary thing and what you say there's a chance, I guess. Uh. Okay, okay, sounds good, it sounds good. Now this job that you got, uh, you're the tournament director at Club One Casino. I'm just curious, um, how'd you get that gig? Uh, I actually played cards for, gosh, as long as I can remember, and I had some friends that were foremen and higher-ups within the casino there in the gaming industry. And I was just in there playing one day, and they uh, had a bunch of openings come up, and they said, hey, have you ever thought about dealing? And I was in between fights, and just kind of taking some time off. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I thought this, I like poker and, you know, dealing sounds easy. And it was. It was super easy. I did that for like three months and quickly realized that I didn't want to stay just a dealer. I felt that there was more I was capable of. There was more I could contribute to the casino. Uh, the gaming industry as a whole really appealed to me. I kind of like the concept of it. It just takes a lot of effort to do it correctly and have fun doing it. So it kind of fitted me. So I kind of just moved up the ladder from there and, I really like poker tournaments, and I, I asked, hey, what, what's it take to be a tournament director and a floor and things like that, and took the test, trained, and been doing that for the last couple of years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The reason I asked is because since you're in the uh, casino and gambling and, and gaming industry, why couldn't you get a job at Tachi Palace? You made a bunch of money for them years ago. <laughs> um, it's just, I live in town, and... Tachi is about a good 45 minute commute for me and mm. I have a bunch of friends that, that pretty much run that casino that I'm working at and I felt it would be a lot easier for me to get my grounding and get my foot in and stuff and poker the, the place I work now is solely what's considered a card room in California it's not a casino so they don't have like slot machines and uh, things like that we just have blackjack, pie job, you know your usual table games we're predominantly a poker room uh, Palace, their poker room isn't really that big uh, so there's probably not as much hours or, you know, maybe work to go around, I guess you could say. Oh, I see, I see, because I was I was very interested in that, because, you know, you, that's where you made your name in the sport of MMA at Tachi Ballison, and that's when you came back to the sport, you re- rebuilt your career in Tachi, so I thought maybe uh, maybe you would wind up there. But but anyways, um, you were in Germany, I believe, a couple weeks ago, right? You were in Germany with, like, Stitch Duran and Frank Trigg and Marcus Davis and Tim Kennedy and a couple other guys. Just curious, what mm-hmm. were you doing over there? Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was an organization called AFE, Armed Forces Entertainment. They work with the USO. And what they do is they do different tours. They'll bring, like, musicians, uh, comedians, other types of athletes, and they bring them to the different military bases, visiting the soldiers, excuse me, doing meet and greets, um, going to the hospitals. It's really just the whole goal point of their, their organization is really just a morale booster for the soldiers overseas. It's not there to, like, go and ride tanks and shoot guns and blow stuff up and goof off. It's go over there. Um, hang out with the soldiers, remind them that, hey, you know, we know you're here. We're going to try to bring a little bit of home to you because we know some of you were stuck here for a while and you're not going to get to go home. Um, they watch a bunch of fights on what's called the Armed Forces Network, right. the AFN. Mm-hmm. 
So they're all huge UFC fans and fight fans, and it was just an opportunity to bring them something that they we know that they would appreciate, and it makes them smile and makes them feel like they're not being forgotten about just because they're overseas on a foreign. Well, it's American bases, but they're over on you know foreign land doing their job, and it's basically all it is. It's just a huge morale booster for them, and it's just a. I was offered the opportunity because I fought in the UFC, which is one of the other things that being in the UFC afforded me was these kind of things to be a part of. And they asked us, hey, you want to be part of it? And I was pumping a new book at the time. And I said, yeah, you know, it'd be fun. I can pump the book. And it's something I may never get to do otherwise. So I'll definitely jump on that opportunity. And it was it was by far one of the top best five times of my life. Easy. I mean, argument could be made for top three. It was the funnest time I think I've had in a long time. Right, right. Now, how many bases did you go to? Oh, geez. Um... We did so many. I want to say easy. I want to pick like eight to nine bases easy, I think, is what we did. I think we ended up doing like 10 total. But we, visited, we visited a lot of bases in Germany. Uh, we visited one, I think, in the Netherlands. Or Netherlands was just a stopover. And then we went over to a couple of Royal Air Force bases in England. Oh, I see. I see. Now, you brought up your book, and I wanted to touch on that a little. Through the Cage Door, that's the title of it. It's set to be released on or in August. Do we have an official date? Tentatively August um, of 2014 is tentative, what it says. Yeah, tentatively August. Um, we're just making sure everything's squared away with the first parts of the book and, and what we want to see uh, distributed out, and then I think we'll be good to go. But yeah, middle, middle to late August, I think, is a tentative shot for it. Mm-hmm. Now I'm just curious, uh, Zach Robinson. He's also a part of this project with you, putting together this book. Why now? Why did you think that right now was the perfect time to put out this book? Um, it was more of a collaboration with my mom. Sat down and discussed what we did, and you know how much of the family history we wanted people to know about. Um, I've been pretty good about keeping that kind of stuff to myself. I don't really share too much of my family with anybody, and uh, it was just a good opportunity to. I guess maybe therapeutically wise, um, some of this stuff needed to be out. It just needs to be told. Um, my end goal for the whole thing is I'm really hoping that my part of the book and what I've gone through from when I was little all the way up until now, a lot of people just know about being paralyzed and fighting in you know an MMA. There's a good 20, 25 years before all of that that basically made me who I was today. And uh, I felt it would be, you know, a good thing to share with everybody and give them a better understanding of, of why I am the way I am and how I came to be, you know, as aggressive as I was and, and, and how I was dominant for a while in my position in the sport and the mentality I carried through it and my drive and goals and things like that. I'm just hoping that it'll, you know, give a boost to somebody maybe who's having a rough time in their life and think, man, you know, I think things are bad and I can read this and look back and be like, well, you know, Cole went through a lot of things and he's still came through and just to you know let people know that there's not always a wall there's always a way around the wall no matter how big the wall seems there's always a way around it and that's kind of what i want to get to people is it, it can get as dark as you think it is but there's there's always a way to find light you just got to be willing to you know to keep going that a little extra further and it's always worth it mm-hmm. Now, what's the timeline for this book? Does it cover, uh, you know, your whole life up until this point? Does it cover just the the early days of your life pre MMA, or kind of, you know, the the uh, beginning when, of your career? What does I, it cover? Before I was born, all the way up until now. Mm. I see. I see. Interesting. Interesting. Cole, I want to talk about your mixed martial arts career. You had a great career. You beat a lot of great fighters. You fought a lot of great fighters. You captured a lot of titles. You gave us many highlights, knockouts, submissions, all kinds of great things. So let's take it back to the beginning. Let's go back to when you got started in mixed martial arts, when you started training. Um, Your martial arts journey actually begins way before you started getting MMA training. You start at the age of six. You start doing karate. In the mid-1990s, you started training in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And then by the age of 16, you became a karate black belt. At age 19, you started training in mixed martial arts. Now, if I had the story correct, you only started training in mixed martial arts because you were trying to stay in shape for the Fresno Police Academy. Is this true? Correct. Yeah, it was just uh, when I was applying with different departments, they would generally ask you, what are you doing to stay in shape? Because uh, they get bonuses for healthy officers, which is pretty ridiculous that <laughs> The, right. state our, the, the state our country is in where they have to get debt that gives you bonuses for jobs where you have to 
be in shape to do your job and they give you bonuses for being in shape. It's, it's pretty funny, but yeah, it was a way to stay in shape and just to, you know, not get lazy and stuff after the academy is physical course. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm just curious, how long were you training MMA before you took your first fight? And also, when exactly did that idea pop into your head, hey, I want to take a fight? When exactly did that happen? Um, I hadn't really been looking for a fight. I kind of just been training. Uh, my coach at the time kind of went looking for a fight for me, and uh, I didn't even realize I had my first fight until Reed Harris walked into our gym looking to hand out flyers and was looking for me to make sure I was still good to go for my fight in like a week or two. And I was like, I'm Cole. And he explained to me, hey, are you still looking, you know, you still good for your fight? How's training going? I, I was totally caught off guard. I had no idea I had a fight, nothing. Nobody had told me anything. Uh, my coach had gone and signed me up for a fight uh, just just because he found an opening and then was going to tell me about it, like, I guess, like a week before. So it was kind of a surprise to find out my first fight for Ray Harris. Mm-hmm. Now, the first seven fights in your career, six of those seven wins are by submission, and you were 7-0 and at the time. So six of those wins by submission, all six of those submissions by triangle choke. Just curious, was there ever a time backstage after a fight where someone came up to you who you had just fought and said, you know what, I knew the triangle was coming, I knew what you were going to do, and I still couldn't stop it. Was there ever a time where someone said that to you? Um, I did. I had uh, he's actually a really cool cat. I've cornered for him before. Randy Spence, he's on, uh, one of the Nick Diaz teammate guys. Those guys up in Stockton, the Diaz brothers and stuff, which are really cool cats. Uh, that, that's the whole other story itself, but um, he came backstage later, and we were talking about it and stuff, and he was he was confident that, that uh, Nick and Nate couldn't triangle him when they were doing practice in jiu-jitsu, preparing for the fight, and he was pretty confident that he couldn't get caught in it, and uh, I, I caught him and put him to sleep with it, and it, it's just, you know, fighter camaraderie. He was just really surprised that it happened, and I was, I was just as surprised, I think, mm-hmm. but um, I've had a couple come backstage and, and tell me that and just, you know, it's kind of cool to hear that in a sense, I guess, because it makes it kind of validates a little bit of the effort I put into back then that, hey, you know, what I'm doing actually works. So it kind of helped me boost some confidence. Mm-hmm. Now, when exactly did the throwing up the triangle start? Because when you won a fight by triangle, you would throw it up. And even as your career progressed, you were throwing up the triangle when they were doing the introductions before the fight even started. I'm just curious, when did that all start, and where did you come up with this idea to do that? Um, It was just something I came up with, like, literally right then and there. It just seemed like something that might be cool, and then it just kind of stuck. It was just kind of like my symbol. Um, on the MMA.TV, the underground forums, my, my name tag was the triangle for as long as I can remember. Uh, it, it was just, it was like a goofy thing. It was just something for fun. I was just trying to kind of build my brand, I guess. Like, you know, UFC calls it building your brand. It's your own image. And I was just trying to do that even back then. I, I wanted to stand out. I wanted to be a fighter that wasn't just considered a fighter within an organization or within a weight class. I wanted to kind of branch myself out so that people thought of me as a fighter not oh there's this WEC fighter there's Cole it's, oh, there's Cole who's the WEC champion that's mm-hmm. kind of what I was trying to gauge from day one I wanted to stand out a little bit mm-hmm. now on the ground you're known for your triangle and standing up you're known for your head kick but are those the ones that you're always catching guys with in the gym and are those like your go-to moves or are those just the ones that work um those would probably be my best moves i got a lot of nice little dirty liver kicks and and setups for head kicks but i just have really solid fast head kicks um i used to do a lot of taekwondo when i was little so i i kind of just built those really quick hips for the high kicks and the fast recovery on them and i just kind of did that in training all the time i mean if you were had your head down you could expect to get kicked in the head just because i would hunt i would head hunt all the time because my philosophy is the quicker I can hurt you the most and put you down, the sooner the fight's over and the quicker I can go and have a beer. So it was just my mentality. I didn't want to fight for points and things like that. I just wanted to fight and get it over fast because that was the whole idea was to beat you as fast as possible. And head kicks seemed to do the trick. So I just kind of learned really good setups for them, feints for it, ways to sneak it in, whatever I could do to get you open to throw a head kick in. Mm-hmm. 
Now, a couple fights I want to talk about. The first fight is the fight back at WEC 5, October of 2002, when you defeated Philip Perez to become the WEC featherweight champion and also the IFC 145 champion as well. That fight, going into it, there was some some bad blood uh, between you and Perez. Just curious, what was that all about? Um, basically, it was rival, rival gym type thing. Um, when I first started my career, the main goal was to kind of just prove that we were the best gym in town. And at the time, doing local fights was how you did it. So it was kind of a combination of that. And I didn't even really know Philip. It was just a gym thing at that point. And at the time, he was like an active gang member. And a lot of those guys on their team were. Uh, they just kind of took it to the next level as far as uh, outside uh, aggressiveness, I guess. It was really just supposed to be a fight between us, but a lot of his buddies came up to me outside while I was at work and things like that, and it really got to be a personal thing after it was all said and done that, you know, we just didn't like them anymore as a whole, and that whole team uh, pretty much disbanded after that fight, actually. That whole gym closed down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, why were there two belts on the line? Obviously, you fought under the WEC banner, so I can see why that title was on the line, but the IFC belt, why was that up for grabs? Um, that was a deal that me and Paul Smith made out. He was the uh, owner and, and coordinator and promoter for IFC at the time. On another trip for a fight out of town, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I had had a conversation with somebody in a limo ride between hotels, and somebody else in the limo overheard a conversation about our, our you know, disgruntledness with an event and some of the way it was handled. And at the time, the way we went about discussing it probably wasn't the most professional way. And it was real immature the way we discussed it. And Paul had heard about our discussion, and it really aggravated him. And looking back on it, you know, now I can understand why he was so aggravated with the way our conversation went. And I heard about this, and I heard how upset he was, and I felt really bad about it because Paul had always been nice to me. He'd always, you know, offered me fights whenever he could. Um, even though it didn't seem like it to me at the time, Looking back on it, I, I found later that he really would try to do what he could for the fighters and every chance he get. And a lot of people just don't really realize that. So I took it upon myself to, to go up to him at a, we were setting up uh, a cage for an event actually that I was helping with. And I, and I wanted to apologize to him and say, hey, you know, apparently I said this in a conversation and somebody overheard it. And I, you know, I wanted to apologize because it came to my attention that you were aware of it. It came to my attention. I wanted to apologize and tell you how bad I felt, and it was really immature of me, and it shouldn't happen. And he really appreciated that effort and said, "You know what? Uh, because you did that, you know, I really like you. I really like the, the effort you made to, to apologize. It takes a man to do that." And he made the decision to put both belts up at the time. So it was like a half organization thing where he made that decision to do it. Mm, I see. I see. And also, what was that cup for? The the trophy that you won that day. What was that for? Um, that was part of winning the WEC title at the time. Back then, they gave a lot of junk, and uh, or, or one sec. Okay. Sorry about that. I was dropping my daughter off. Oh sure. Um, it was uh, it was real fancy back then. A lot of the stuff they did was uh, flashy, um, as much pizzazz and hurrahs you can get. And plus, the WEC back then was a real up and coming organization, mm -hmm. and they really did what they could to make themselves appealable to other fighters. They wanted to be the organization to fight for, and it worked. Actually, they ended up being coming, you know, the WC ended up being the organization to fight for, and the palace ended up being the place you fought at in California if you wanted to move on to better things. But it was just, you know, they really went all out. It was a really, really big fight. Um, it was one of the largest fights they had had in, in the entirety of their, of their organization out there. There was a lot of buildup. The whole arena was there just for our fight. So you could cut the arena in half, and half were there for him, half were there for me. The rest of the fight, great. They were just added bonus, but everybody was pretty much there for our fight specifically. So they wanted to make a big deal out of it, so they got me the big-ass trophy, and I ended up taking beer out of that thing all night. <laughs> really? That was going to be my next question. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, went, I went back to uh, Fresno that night, and me and a bunch of my teammates and stuff, we all went out to a sports bar that I was a bouncer for at the time. And I just handed him the mug and just said, just keep filling it up. And that was pretty much how we spent the rest of that night. <laughs>
Oh, <laughs> that's great. That's a great story. Um, what, what, what are some of your memories from the actual fight itself? I mean, obviously, it, it probably went according to plan. You ended up triangling him in, in the first round. Uh, from the actual fight itself, what do you remember about it? Um, I remember being super nervous because it was my first title fight. Uh, it was against what was supposed to be probably one of the toughest opponents I had had at the time. Um, because at the time, Phil was just a beast. He was, like, literally tossing people out of the ring, um, just dominating everybody he came across. They were having a really hard time finding him opponents. And so it was, was going to be a really good test for me, but I was super nervous with it being my first title shot. You know, you always wonder, no matter how many wins you've had, you're always going to wonder, you know, should I be having this title fight? Am I ready for it? Am I going to embarrass myself? So you get the normal jitters, um, and I, was, I realized how big of an event it was for the local MMA scene and how many people were there to watch. So I kind of had that added pressure of fighting in front of a lot of people that I knew. I just didn't want to mess up. I just didn't want to lose, you know, in front of everybody I knew there. Um, And then the stuff going on outside of the ring, outside behind the scenes, with the teams and the camps and stuff, Yeah, it just, there was a lot going on. I mean, they had extra police there because... You know, I had been told I was going to get shot, and no matter what happened to the fight, I wasn't going to leave in the arena. There was just all kinds of crap going on. So, you know, a nerve tension thing for me as well as my team, because my whole team was there in groups. You know, I had a whole team around my folks there out with them, making sure nothing happened. So it was just a really surreal type of experience from any of the other fights I'd ever had until then. Mm-hmm. Looking back on it now in 2014, that fight is a is a very big deal because you became the uh, first ever WEC featherweight champion, and you know in the in the history books that's a, a massive accomplishment because that was a great organization that went on to do great things. Um, at the time, did it feel that big to you? Like looking back on it now, it's it's huge because you look at the the lineage of that title, and you were the first guy to have it. But uh, at the time, was it a big deal for you? Oh yeah, it was huge. Like I said, it was. I mean, first off, it was a great organization to fight for. I love Reed Harris. He always did right by me. Um, he, after the W, he moved on. And, and Reed Harris has always been there for him. So, I mean, that's just, that was super cool for me to win that belt because I almost felt like I was winning it for him because we had such a good relationship that I, I, I wanted to win that belt. I wanted, I wanted to be their champion because they had been so good to me. The Palace had been so good to me. I had so many different reasons that I wanted to win that belt so bad because I felt like it was my way of saying thank you for all the efforts that guys like Reed had done, Christian had done, the Palace, things like that. Um, so I really wanted to win it and just how big it ended up being then I still realized I was the first. Like, I knew I was going to be the first one to win that belt. And I just, I wanted to be that first guy so bad. And then looking back at it now, knowing the lineage of it, like you said, and how, how popular it became, um, it was super cool. I, I, I had a lot that I wanted to do by winning that belt. So it was super important for me to do that because um, it was a lot of firsts for me. So. Mm-hmm. Now, the next fight I want to talk about, it was a fight that happened outside of WEC. It happened under the Gladiator Challenge banner, uh, April of 2003. It was the first loss of your career. You fought a very talented fighter, a guy who, who nowadays doesn't give, get as much credit as he deserves. You know, a true pioneer of the lighter weight classes, very talented guy. Um, you know, I don't really know what happened to him. He hasn't been very active these last couple of years, but Bao Quach. You fought him at Gladiator Challenge 15. He defeated you by unanimous decision. What do you remember about that fight, and what did you learn from that loss? Um, I learned uh, a couple of things I learned from that loss was, you know, toughness, first off. Um, I learned I can actually take a really good punch. Uh, I got my orbital floor crushed in my left eye and in the first round of that fight and had to fight with one eye for the remainder of the fight. But I realized how much of a, of a of a beating, basically, I can take. Because if you watch the tape, we stand there and we just slug on each other for the two rounds. Um, another thing I learned about that fight is always make sure how many rounds your fight is before you start the fight. Uh, both of our teams, my camp and his camp, uh, Chris Brennan and those guys at Next Gen, we were all under the impression that it was going to be a three-round fight. Uh, we come to find out after the second round that it was just going to be a two-round fight. So we both felt like we kind of got gypped. Um, I felt at the end of that fight that I had been winning the fight in the second round. 
uh, we never really got a third round. They they only let us have two rounds, and then they, they stopped the fight saying, oh, it's only a two-round fight. I had never heard of that before, and I think I thought it was kind of goofy, but the Gladiator Challenge did a lot of weird shit like that back then. Mm-hmm. They would have, like, two-round fights on an entire card just to make more fights and make more money for, for Ted. You know, that was just... It was just kind of his MO back then. His business model was make as much money as he could. So mm-hmm. it was kind of unfair to the fighters. But uh, it was just a two-round fight. And, you know, we've talked since then a couple times. Uh, Bow's still a really cool cat. I've always liked him and respected him. A lot of people, like you said, they don't give him enough credit. He was uh, one of the pioneers of the sports back when guys like Jeff Kalan, uh Henry Matamoto, guys like that were helping to build those weight classes back when basically those weight classes didn't exist and nobody really knew who they were. They just put them as the little guys. So, you know, a, a lot of people overlook those guys and they shouldn't. They should go back and really study who the original guys were for that weight class. But it was a good fight. We kind of beat on each other. Um, we both ended up breaking our hands. Uh, we both ended up breaking each other's eyes because he had a fight, I think, with Kid John Momoto in Japan, like, I want to say a month later, and he had to pull out of that fight because they said I hated to have surgery at his eye socket as well. Mm-hmm. So I found out how much of a beating I can take and how much of a beating I can give and always make sure you know how many fights you're around your fight schedule for. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a two-part question. Number one, why did this fight happen outside of WEC? Because he just fought Jeff Curran before that fight. You you fought at WEC 5 and won the title. At WEC 4, he fought against Curran. And then this fight took place under the Gladiator Challenge banner. And then when he beat you, since you had the WEC title, why didn't they give him a title shot and, and give you that third round, as, as you put it? Um, why did none of that stuff ever happen? And why did it happen under the Gladiator Challenge uh, banner when you actually did fight him things were weird back then uh the sport was it's it's still in like i'd say toddler stages i guess or a little bit older than toddlers but back then it was it was in almost pre pre infant stages i guess you could call it so there was no real structure no real significant contracts of you can't fight for anybody else like they do now now it's you sign a contract with an organization if you're a title holder you don't fight for anybody else it was just that was the way it was. Um, I've actually had that happen twice in my career. Uh, the first being the gladiator fight. Um, I, I don't really know. They, like I said, it was weird back then. Um, guys like Reed, they were really, really cool. Um, they knew that back then fighters fighting were doing it because that's, you know, a lot of us, that's how we paid the bills. That's how we bought groceries, paid rent, things like that. So they weren't really out to prevent us from taking fights everywhere. Um, I had asked uh, Gladiator for you know as many fights as I can get, and they gave me a multi fight deal. I said, "Yeah, you fight for whatever you want." WC was like, "Yeah, fight for whatever you want, no big deal." So everyone was really cool. There was no set in stone. You cannot fight for these guys, and I was just trying to get experience everywhere I could. And anytime I was offered a fight, I basically took it because I, I wanted to get as many fights as I could under my belt and get as much experience. But um, it's it's. It happened back then. You had a lot of guys. That's why they had a lot of, a lot of unification title fights. Um, the IFC one was one. Uh, later on in my career, when I got the Palace uh, Bantamweight title, I got the title, and then I went over and fought in Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's all, there was a lot of things that sometimes promoters are real flexible with. Uh, they're, they're not as flexible nowadays, I would say. They understand the value of keeping their fighters within their organization. And I don't think that's to be from a monopolizing or uh, a selfish dictatorship type mentality. It's just that they realize how valuable their fighters are to their organization. So they are basically protecting their product. They, they want their product to only work for their company. And I don't blame them, but back then it was, it was a lot different. You could get away with a lot more. And everybody was cross-fighting in different organizations and stuff because if we didn't do that, um, I don't think as many organizations would have had as many fighters to use for their shows back then. If everybody just stuck with one specific organization, I think you would have had a lot fewer shows and you would have had a lot smaller cards with a lot more unknown fighters on it, allowing us to cross fight, I think kind of helped build the sport because if you're a California, a Southern California fighter and you find out you have a bunch of Northern California fans and you get offered a fight in Northern California, of course you're going to want to take it because it's good for the promoter and the fans want to see you. 
now, if you do that, it, you're going to have a hard time to do that because you have a lot of contracts that prevent you from fighting elsewhere. So it was helping to grow the sport, I think. And everybody realized that back then, so nobody really nitpicked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You bring up a bunch of good points uh, there. So I'm just curious, what do you like better? Do you like the way things are now? I mean, obviously, uh, it's a lot more popular and there's a lot more money in it, but at the same time, it isn't as flexible as it once was. So so what do you like better, the way things are now or, or the way things were when you got going? Um, I'll probably get a lot of grief from people over this, but I like the way it's going now. Um, it seems like it's going in a more dictatorship role, but it's really not. Um, people give Dana White and the UFC grief all the time. And before I say this, let me get this out. I'm not a UFC fanboy. I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a butt kisser. This is just how I view the sport, having been in it as long as I have, and how I view it having been on both sides of the fence, knowing what goes on backstage with the organizations. Um, everybody gives Dana White and the UFC such a hard time because they think that they're trying to monopolize the sport and they're trying to own the sport. Well, realistically, if you look at it, when somebody says Dallas Cowboys, you don't think European Football League. You don't think uh, some other football organization. It's the NFL. When you think football, you think NFL. When you think baseball, you think, you know, the National Baseball League. You think hockey, same thing with the NHL. All the sports are, are basically unified within themselves. So that's all the UFC is really trying to do, in my opinion, is they want you to think, MMA, they want you to think UFC. They want it to be one thing. And I think the sooner they can get that done, the sooner they can have things like fighter unions. Uh, They already do fighter insurance for their fighters. If you're a contracted fighter and you get hurt, even if you don't have a fight coming up and you get hurt in training camp, they'll pay for it, you know, within reason if they find out you were dirt biking off the dunes in Pismo and broke your leg, then they're going to say, well, you know, (laughs) have a nice day, so sorry. But if you get hurt, they take care of you. So that's one thing that they do already that they don't even have to do. A lot of people don't understand this. There's a lot of things that that they do that they don't have to do. They don't have to pay for your medical insurance if you get hurt outside of, uh, you know, in training camp, even if you don't have a fight coming up. They can be like, oh, yeah, if you have a fight coming up that you're scheduled for, uh, we'll cover it. And if you don't, oh, well. But, no, they they take care of it. They take care of their fighters. Making the, making the UFC the organization, it will allow them things like a fighters union. It'll allow for better pay. It'll allow for better marketing, better self branding, better sponsors. I mean, there's so many different things that will come with it. I mean, just look at all the million dollars, billions of dollars of sponsors that the NFL deals with. That baseball, basketball, NASCAR. I mean, there's so much money there, and this sounds this really sounds money hungry, but there's so much money to be made for the fighters that they just People need to just let the UFC do what they're doing and just make it better because down the road, it'll be better for everybody. The sponsors, the fighters, the fans. Um, I do think they're oversaturating the market right now a little bit, but they've got a game plan for a reason. So I, I think people need to just look at it from a, a business perspective and think, well, how do we make this better as a whole? How do we make the sport better as a whole? They're, they're doing it in small steps. But it's just going to take some time. But I, I think people need to just understand that they're not trying to monopolize it. They just you got to make one sport, one group, if you want to have, you know, things that are good for the fighters. You know, union contracts, all that kind of stuff comes with being just one organization. When you got all these multiple organizations, you got everybody doing different things. There's no cohesion. Fighters are getting treated differently within each different organization. So, and granted, you know, you're going to have your favorites. You're going to have some fighters within the organization that are probably taken care of way better than a lot of the other fighters. Well, you know, that goes true with any other sport, too. You've got your Michael Vicks. You've got your Emmett Smiths, your Joe Montanas. You know, you've got all your players, even nowadays, your Derek Jeters and stuff, your LeBron James. All these, all these players, they get taken care of so much better. But at the same time, they're so much better than a lot of the other people that don't get taken care of as much. So... That kind of has a give and take thing with the sport, so it's going to be the same no matter where you go. But then again, if you want to be taken care of like that, well, you need to move your way up the food chain. Essentially, it's, it's up to you to do that. So mm-hmm. I think it's a good thing that uh, the UFC is moving in that direction, but it's just going to take a lot longer, I think, than they're anticipating. Mm-hmm. 
Now, what do you think about fighter pay? Is is it too low? Because I go back and forth on this. Uh, on you know, on one hand, if you're you know, let's say you fight two times a year and you're at the bottom pay scale, so that's eight grand a show and eight grand to win. And let's say you fight two times a year and you lose both fights. Well, you've only made sixteen grand off fighting, and that's before taxes and before you pay uh, you know your cornermen, gym fees, and all kinds of other stuff, and your bills and all kinds of stuff. So I don't even know what you really pocket in that that whole situation. But then on the other hand, let's Let's say you're a, a guy from Brazil that no one's ever heard of, and you're fighting in Colorado that no one has ever, you know, no one in that local fan base has ever heard of. So, uh, not only are, are the fans who are coming to the arena not paying to see you, the people at home are not, uh, you know, you're not grabbing eyeballs. You're not the guy that, okay, I got to see this guy who I've never heard of, you know, fight. You know, it really doesn't make any sense. So, uh, you know, I, I can see both sides of the argument. Uh, which one do you fall on? Is fighter pay too low? Um, that's a good point. I think fighter pay overall is too low. If you look at what even the top guys are making, guys in boxing make for fighting a third of the time, Mm -hmm. you know, boxers have one, maybe two fights a year. They make millions. Um, your top elite of the elite guys, your George St. Pierre's, your Anderson Silva's, your Johnny Hendricks, you know, your Chuck Liddell, those guys make millions of dollars, but they're at the top of the food chain. I mean, realistically, it's this. I made more money losing my first fight in the UFC, uh, with the exception of Japan, than I've made more winning almost any of my other fights anywhere else. Does, does that make sense? Mm, really? Hmm. So I made, I think I made like 6000 uh, or like 8000 for my first fight in the UFC, something like that, and it was a loss. That was still equal to or better than any of the win bonuses I had made any of my other fights, you know, that was, to me, that was top tier pay for the level I was fighting at. You know, if I was fighting on the pay-per-view card, even if I was the first fight on the pay-per-view card, would a grand seem, seem fair? Probably not because they're obviously making money off of me if I'm on the pay-per-view, but I wasn't. I was on the undercard, on the bottom of the prelims. So for me to grant about my pay would have been just ignorant and ridiculous. Um, I thought the pay was fair. The higher up the food chain you go, I feel like it could probably be better, but that's only because the sports, it's a limitation based on where the sport is within mainstream. I don't think it's a limitation based on what the UFC is doing. They're paying, they, I think they pay fair prices. But I mean, but if you look at boxing, those guys are making millions of millions of dollars. So if you compare it to other sports, yeah, we're probably getting paid less than that. But at the same time, I still think we're getting paid fair. If you want to get paid more, again, you have to work your way up the food chain. You have to win fights. I mean, every time you win your fight, your pay increases up your contracted scale. If you fight four times in a year and you only win twice, well, you know, if you're only making so much money, you really have nobody else to blame but yourself. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? At, at the end of the day, it still falls on the fighter's lap and the fighter's responsibility to show up and do their job. And your job is to show up and fight and win. Now, that said, I go back to the thing about the UFC doing things they don't have to do. I put on a really good fight, and I did my job. Even if I lose, if I put on a good fight, the fans are happy, they're cheering, they're loud. Even if they don't know who I am, if they enjoyed my fight, the UFC sees that, and they thank you. You know, I got a check in the mail like two weeks after my fight that was uh, a bonus check of like six grand, and I called uh, Sean Shelby and said, hey, I think there's a mistake. Um, I got paid at the arena. There's this check in the mail. What should I do with it? And Sean flat out said, no, that's for you. That's, that's a thank you. That's for, thank you for doing your job. You know, you showed up and put on a good fight. Thank you. So, you know, to get six grand in the mail that I wasn't expecting back then was huge. I mean, six, that six grand, that meant like, you know, four, four months of rent and groceries. So I, I never really complained too much about my pay. Um, I can see where some of the guys in the top tier might gripe about it a little, but you know what? You should have had your contract negotiated better. You should have had your manager negotiate you a better contract. Um, maybe you should be putting on better fights. You know, if you're not getting paid better, maybe you need to sit back and look at your fights and realize why you're not getting paid better. Because if you're a boring fighter and you win fights, you, what are you going to gripe about, man? You're a boring fighter. Fans mm-hmm. aren't paying to see you. And like I said, at the end of the day, MMA is still a business. It's an entertainment business. It's a fight business. But it's a business. You're there to do your job and put asses in seats and make your promoter money. It's a it's a it's a dirty, dark reality, but it's a reality none the same. The promoter is putting on the show, 
They make money off ticket sales. You're there to put seats in tickets and put ashes in seats. And if you're boring, you can't really complain about your pay, man. It, it's just, that's how I view it. You know, if you want to be better paid, be exciting. Win fights. Earn fans. Go out there. Be vocal. Um, you want the fans to want to watch you. Even if it's to lose, like fans would show up just to watch Tito lose because at one point they didn't like him. Who cares? They're showing up to watch you fight, man. That's all that matters. And at the end of the day, the UFC realized that. And whether they liked Tito or not, he got paid well because he put butts in seats. And that's the name of the game. How many asses can you get in a seat? So the comment you made about the Denver guy uh, from Brazil, if nobody knows who he is there and he's playing on the undercard on some Denver show, then, you know, so be it. He better have a really good knockout to get himself on the highlight reel and have people go, holy shit, who is that guy? That's how you start getting people to know your name. You got to go out there and you got to earn it. Nobody's going to give it to you. You, you got to go out there and take it. Mm-hmm. I agree with everything you said, and that's the harsh reality of the business. At the end of the day, the UFC is a business, and they have to turn a profit. And for whatever reason, fans, media, etc., they can't grasp that concept. Um, th- that's just the way it is. Anyways, uh, moving on, en- enough about the UFC. Let's get back to you. Your titles. You have the WEC featherweight championship you also have the wec 155 native american title you have the ifc 145 belt you have the tachi palace fights 135 belt are those the only belts that you have or am i missing some um yeah i have the wc the ifc and the tachi palace and the wc native american um i think those were yeah those were the belts i was able to to pick up in my career Mm -hmm. do you still have all of them um, unfortunately, no. Um, the Palace one, they only gave me one belt, and when I lost my rematch, um, they made me get a fancy belt, so I don't blame them. Um, the IFC and the WEC, one, one I sold, and the other one I donated to charity to raise money for the Ryan Bennett Foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh, way back in the day, uh, after he passed away, I donated one to a, to a fundraiser for that, and I got sold to a guy in Japan. Um, I think I still have the Native American belt. Uh, matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I still have that. So, yeah, out, out of all of them, it's, it's weird to say, but I only have one. But uh, they all, you know, they all went where they needed to go. Um, the only one that really I missed would be the WEC belt, but that went to a good cause, so I don't really miss it as much. Mm-hmm. And you only had one of the WEC titles because they changed their belt like four or five times, didn't they? Do you only have one um, one of the yeah, versions? Yeah, they had one basic belt before they moved to Vegas. It was just a real basic one. Uh-huh. Um, I got, I think, like uh, when you would defend the belt back then, they would just give you another one, but it wasn't really fancy. I think it just said like champion on it or something. It was, yeah. was kind of cheesy. But like I said, back then... Um, they didn't really put too much money into into belts and stuff. They kind of put the money into the promotion and, and marketing for it and stuff like that. So, but I mean, then again, I didn't really, you know, I wasn't really going around collecting belts. Faber, Faber, on the other hand, Faber went around collecting belts. You know, those were important to him. But me, I just wanted to go in there and fight and do my job and get paid and, you know, and go home and pay my bills. So I, I didn't really lose too much sleep over the belts. I think I've got one floating around maybe in my house that was from when I defended one of the WAC times. But um, no, it was just usually the one belt. You know, you brought it, and if you won, they gave it back to you and said, okay, you get to take your belt home. So it was it was more simpler back then, I guess. Mm, I see, I see. Now, what does the Native American title look like? Is that a red, white, and blue belt, or, or does that look like something yeah, else? Yeah, it's uh, red leather. It's a gold, big old gold plate on it. Um, it's got Native, some Native American feathers attached to it. It was pretty much custom made. Uh, it was funny to find out, though, that there is, for that particular fight, there was two belts made. There was one made in case I had one, and there was another one made uh, in case Poppy's one. And it had his name on it and all that fancy stuff. They made it a, a pretty fancy one just for him in case he won. Um, I found that out years later, and I always thought it was funny, but it just, back then, you know, it was, Oh yeah, it was different back then. It was it was a lot of a lot of different scenes back then. Mm-hmm. I wonder what happened to that belt. That would be a, a hot collectible. His the uh, one that should have went to him. Um, yeah, I think he has it actually. They gave it to him. I, I, think, I think they did. Um, I don't get me wrong. I love Poppy. He's my brother. I'll, I'll do whatever I can to help that guy get ready for a fight, no matter what, because he's still active and everything with Bellator and stuff. Right. 
So um, I'll do whatever I can to help that guy. But it was funny because they, they, it seemed every time he had a fight, it, it was for some kind of a title, and they just made up titles for him to fight because that was just that was just how it was back then. I mean, he was off the tribe. He was from there. So I don't really blame them because it was a good marketing standpoint. But it was just funny to see it from another fighter's perspective that every time he fought, it was from, for some different belt that they came up with. So mm-hmm. I, I never, we never really got butthurt about it. It was just kind of silly. Mm-hmm. But, um, but so like I said, I, I love the guy. And, and anytime he needs my help, I'll help him. But it was just kind of like this running thing where we just kind of got a giggle out of it. Mm-hmm. So basically, that title was made up, and they really had no interest in you ever defending it since you won it and not him? Pretty much. Um, they used to love me out there. The crowd loved me until I fought poppies, and then they just hated me at that point. Um, they threw bottles at us. They were spitting at us. Um, I really think at that point the Palace like, really hoped he would win it um, because they had this big old fancy belt made for and stuff. So, And again, I don't blame them. Again, it's a business. They saw more marketing value in having Poppies as their champion and less marketing value in having me as their champion. So I, I, I don't blame them. Again, it was just silly to see, you know, favoritism, I guess. Mm, I see, I see. Now, are you full-blood Apache? Um, no, I'm half. Uh, my dad's full-blood and my mom's uh, Czechoslovakian. Oh, I see, I see. Now, who started calling you the Apache kid? Um some guys at the gym because <laughs> I was really young when I started fighting and they all knew I was Indian uh, I think somebody said it one day and I think the rest of them just agreed to use it as like a joke and it just it stuck and the promoters were like oh we really like that name you should hold on to it so it just went I mean it was just a, it was like a running joke it was just that was my name it was a joke to begin with but it stuck and we just held on to it and it'd be kind of harsh awesome to use the same name now since I'm like I'm going to be 33 in right. August so <laughs> I think it'd be kind of hard for me to get away with the same thing now. Right, right. That was going to be my next question. Did you feel that you, you know, outgrew that name? Uh, anyways, they never tried to change it to like Mr. Triangle or, or the Triangle uh, Man or something like that, anything had, like that? I had people on the underground for a while trying to, you know, campaign and lobby for me to change my name, but it just, it was my name and I just stuck with it. And it was, I was, I never really cared for a fight name. It, it didn't really matter to me, but... The longer I was in the career, the longer I realized that it was a good marketing thing to have, and that really stood out. So I just ran with it and tried to promote it as best I could. But, I mean, I never really thought about changing it because it, it didn't really matter to me because I, whether I fought and won or fought and lost, the name didn't really help, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, I'm just curious. That fight was at lightweight, and then your fight after that was also at lightweight when you fought against Joseph Martin. Um, just curious, why were you dabbling as a lightweight? You were their featherweight champion. Why were they having you fight at lightweight? They needed a fight, and I needed a fight, and it was the only one they had available. Mm, I, I pretty much, I, I, like I said, I fought. if I didn't fight, bills didn't get paid, so I pretty much took any fight that was offered. Mm. I see, I see. Now, the Joseph Martin fight, that's the next fight I want to talk about. That was a very interesting one. You won by flying triangle in the first round, but I got to ask you, that stare down at the beginning, um, for people who don't know what we're talking about or, or have never seen that fight, uh, it, it, it's reminiscent of Anderson Silva, Chris Weidman, how they had their stare down, their lips touched and their nose touched and all kinds of stuff. What, what was going on there? Was there bad blood between you two guys going in there? Or was it just the heat of the moment of the stare down? You know, what, what happened there? What was that all about? It was just more of the heat of the moment. Um, Joe was a really tough cat. He probably didn't have the best record. So people don't really, you know, didn't really follow him, but he was a tough cat. He was coming out of, uh, Shamrock's gym. So, um, those were all tough cats back then. Even if they weren't, you know, really good records, they were the type of guys that they were still tough guys. Even if you beat them, it wasn't an easy win. So, it was just knowing I was against a tough guy, and it was just the heat of the moment. Joe came to fight, I came to fight, and we both just, for some reason, didn't like each other at that particular moment. And it was just because we were both there to beat each other's ass. Um, Not because we didn't like each other, but because we both knew we had a fight on our hands against a tough cat. And it was just the mentality, the, the, the spot of mentality that we put ourselves in that I have to be really mean right now because this is going to be a really tough guy. i got to be really mean so I can hurt him as fast as I can. Mm-hmm. So it was just the end of the moment. We just got in there and decided we were just going to hate each other. <laughs> that was, that was right. basically it. Right, right. Now, 
it was a flying triangle, so you locked the triangle up on on the feet, and then he was, you know, pressing up against the cage, and then all of a sudden he, you, you kind of didn't have it, but at the same time you did have the triangle, it's just you needed to tighten it up a little more, and then he slammed you, and then you tightened the, the triangle up, and then you got him to tap. Um, was that his mistake, slamming you in the fight? Yeah, yeah. I, um, at that moment, I was, uh, I was hoping he would slam me because I knew it wouldn't knock me out or anything, but I needed him to get the leverage. I needed to get a better angle on him. Um, had he kept me up against the cage like that, he probably could have maybe worked his way out. But at the same time, carrying 150 pounds on your shoulders of somebody that's just hanging on your neck, I don't think he would have been able to hold me up for too long anyway. But, um, yeah, the slam actually helped. Him slamming me down like that allowed me to readjust it and lock it in even tighter. I mean, don't get me wrong, I was getting that choke no matter what. Mm-hmm. Once I got my legs wrapped around you like that, you're not going anywhere. I, You're mine. I own you. Mm-hmm. It's more of a matter of when as a matter of if now. It's just a matter of time once I wrap my legs on you because right. you're, you're just not going anywhere. I got you. You're just not going anywhere. Right. So it was just a matter of time. Um, it just would have taken a little bit longer, I think, had, had he stayed on his feet. Mm-hmm. It, what was crazy about it was it, it looked like you were you were pulling guard, but then immediately you you kept scooting your hips up higher, higher, and then got it into a triangle position. It was it was crazy. You know, you started off real low and then continued to go higher and higher, and then he slammed you, and then or yeah, he slammed you, and then you you locked up the choke. I'm just curious. Uh, he weighed in at 155, and you weighed in at 150 for a lightweight fight. Just curious at that point in time, how much were you walking around at? Um, I was probably walking around at 150, 145. I, I didn't really weigh much back then. I really never had to cut weight. Um, I think I only had like one fight back then uh, that I really cut weight for, and I think that was a favor fight. I think I had to cut like, you know, three or four pounds for that fight. I, I pretty much walked around at the weight class I fought in. Um, you know, as it got later in my career, I ended up cutting like 20 pounds a fight. I found down weight as my, my niche. But uh, I never really cut weight. I just walked around at like 45, 50. It was just, I just fought. That was really it. I didn't really put too much science into it or anything like that. Mm, I see, I see. Now, when was the point where you started to add some science into it? Um, yeah, it's a good question, man. I think once I got to the higher tier of my career and the opponent started getting top threat, I realized I had to start evaluating it a little more. I had to put a little more weight on to try to get some, some more muscle and some more strength and it has a uh, higher hitting power and then just kind of started torturing with the science of cutting weight, seeing how it worked, things like that. I didn't really get too heavy into weight cutting until uh, I think it was just just before, actually the Van Wales fight was the first fight I think I ever had to really cut weight for hard to make 35s and I think I cut like 10, 15 pounds for that fight. So. That's around the time I think I, I realized that there was a real science to it, and then when I came back from the from the, the being paralyzed, that's when I had already realized how well, weight cutting worked and things like that. I looked into it some more, and I was able to kind of fine tune it to a science. But it wasn't until the higher end of my career where I realized I needed to start cutting weight to be competitive. Mm, I see. I see. After the Joe Martin fight, you fought against Uriah Faber at WEC 19. Um, that was a fight where you lost uh, due to a corner stoppage, so it officially went as a TKO, and then Faber took the belt from you, and, and we all know the rest is history. But uh, what are your, what are some of your memories from that fight? Uh, from the Faber one? Yeah. Jeez. Um, I had a lot going on in that fight, actually. Um, I just uh, moved... I was trying to avoid some law enforcement problems. So I'd been living in Nebraska for like a week and a half, two weeks leading up to that fight. Um, I hadn't really had the best training camp because I said, and like, don't get me wrong, I don't make it cute to say anything. Faber beat my ass fair and square. Um, I, I just had a lot going on. Um, I didn't really feel strong. I didn't feel awake. Um, I remember backstage, I was doing jumping rope and stuff and trying to get warmed up, and I just couldn't do it. I was yawning backstage still, and uh, Bob Cook took one look at me and goes, you, you better find a way to get rid of that shit right now. That's not going to work. And I just couldn't shake it. I just couldn't, like, wake my body up. I couldn't get in the rhythm. I couldn't warm up. Um, I went out cold pretty much to the fight, and that's why when he hits me with that first punch, I went down. Uh, I actually thought he knocked me out because when I looked up, I thought it was the referee standing above me, 
and all I thought was, oh, crap, I got knocked out. But then the referee hit me. <laughs> all I could think of was, why is Josh hitting me? It was Josh Rosenthal was the ref. Right. I, I can think of was, why is Josh hitting me? And then I realized that the, the, the sound of the crowd kicked back in. It was almost like a grenade went off. It was real quiet. Mm -hmm. And then he hits me, and then I'm thinking this, and then I hear the crowd again, and I'm realizing, oh, shit, that's favor still hitting me. And I realized the fight was still going, and I kind of came to autopilot, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just, it was surreal. Uh, and he, at one point, I thought I had a chance to finish the fight when he went for an ankle lock. I sat up, and I started dropping elbows. And I actually thought that I had a chance to finish the fight, so I kind of pulled on the gas. And I got a little over over committed, and that's when he, he swept me and took me down. But uh, I was never really out of the fight. Um, I just kind of thought this sucks the whole time because he was just dropping elbow after elbow on my face. And I was getting more tired and more tired. And with the blood trickling down to my face, I just I really knew I was in a bad spot. But uh, I just kept trying. I mean, if you watch the fight again, no matter how bad I was taking the elbows and how bloody I was, I still kept going for triangles and submissions and sweeps and I just you could see if you want to you can still see me fighting for it but it was it was uh, probably one of the first ass weapons I took that uh, I fondly fondly remember as far as uh, MMA fights mm -hmm. After the Faber fight, you fought against another legend of the sport. You fought against Jens Pulver. It was a fight at lightweight. Looking back on that fight, is that a fight that you probably shouldn't have taken considering the weight, or was it something where you just couldn't turn it down? You know, a big opportunity. Pulver is a, a big name in the sport. IFL at the time was a, a very big show and, and on the rise. Uh, w w was that something you looked back on and been like, yeah, that probably was, wasn't a good idea to take that fight? Yeah, um, look back on it, I probably shouldn't have took the fight. Um, you probably could have told me that you're going to get knocked out, and I probably still would have took the fight just because it was too much money to pass up. They were pretty much paying me almost ten grand just to show up and fight them. Um, it was an opportunity to get right back on the horse and try to get the momentum going. Right, you know, just to try to keep going. Don't don't stop just because you lost the fight. Keep going. Keep the momentum going. Try to win. Um, and plus, it was an opportunity to take a fight against another big name. That if I had beat him, it probably would have countered the favor loss a little bit. People would have been like, "Oh, okay, well, you know, okay, Cole Cole still has it." Um, I, I just probably shouldn't have taken the fight that close. I mean, I just got the stitches out of my head. I think like a week before the fight. So, it, it, in hindsight, it was probably a fight I shouldn't have taken. And at a weight class, I definitely shouldn't have taken. He was coming off of his uh, Pride Bushido fights with her. Their lightweight class, I think, was like 165 pounds. Right. So he was a big boy, and I saw it at, at the fight. And I just, I just shouldn't have took the fight. It was just a bad decision on me to take the fight. And it's nobody else's fault. It's not the organization's fault. It's not the promoter. It's not my coach. It's not my team. It's nobody else's fault but mine for taking that fight because um, it was my decision. And there was some pretty adamant voices within my team and camp against it, saying, you shouldn't take this fight. It's not a good idea. But I told him it was too much money and too much of an opportunity to pass up, so I took it. Mm -hmm. After that fight, you fought at WEC 23 against Antonio Benuelos. Uh, you lost that fight by unanimous decision. <laughs> In that fight, basically what went wrong for you was you were trying to, to make up, possibly? Were you trying to make up for the, the Faber fight and the, the Pulver fight, and, and those kind of affected your performance in that fight, or was there something totally different that uh, affected you um, in that one? I don't think anything really affected my performance except the weight cut. Um, that was the first time I had ever cut the 35s. Um, Reed Harris kind of got the idea in my head that maybe fighting at 35s was a good way to reinvent myself. And everybody in my camp agreed with them. I agreed with them. It sounded like a really good idea. It sounded like a smart idea. Um, he was looking at it from more of a friend's perspective than a business perspective. He was trying to just, you know, because Reed was my buddy even outside of the ring. Mm -hmm. And he was just trying to look at a way of, I really like Cole. What can I do to help him further his career? What options do we have? What what can I suggest to him that maybe will help him better his career? And fighting at Bantamweight weight was his suggestion. He felt it was a good weight class. It was an up-and-coming weight class. He felt that I was small enough to make that weight class, and it would be a good move for me. He felt I could be successful there. So that was his suggestion, and we agreed with it. Um, nothing else really went into that fight except the weight cut, I think, is what really hurt me because I had no, no energy whatsoever. Um, again, if you watch that fight, no, no disrespect to Antonio at all. He's, he's a cool cat. I like him, but he wasn't going to finish me in that fight. 
So I was in real no danger of getting finished. I just couldn't find a way to finish him. And I was too tired to do anything really to avoid his takedowns. And his wrestling was just far, far surpassed mine. And, you know, because I had pretty much no wrestling. And he had tons of wrestling. So it was just a bad combination of weight cut and fighting a guy that I didn't really prepare too much for. So it, it, it was a good decision to take the fight and do the fight. It was just a bad time to test out the first time cutting weight to 35 because I really had no idea how to do it. And it just hurt. It hurt really bad to make that weight for the first time because I'd never done it before and I didn't know how to do it. And it, it hurt really bad. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, it's been well documented, uh, th- this next topic that's coming up, um, but I'm, I don't want to dive too much into it because I, I know it's going to be in your book, but I, I just want to touch on it briefly. Um, after that fight, 2007 is is when this next event takes place. Uh, you you suffer a serious staph infection that left you partially paralyzed and in need of of spinal surgery. I'm just curious. Um, when did you did you notice that there was a problem? Like how you, you get this staph infection? Then how how much time passes before these other effects really kick in? Um, it all happened within like a two week period. It, it kind of kicked in right away. There was no real warning, no real prepare time for it or anything. It just, it pretty much just happened. Mm-hmm. And, and, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, it, um, from the time I noticed the staff to when I went and saw the doctor to when I woke up and couldn't feel my legs anymore, I mean, it was really, it was literally like a, like a, like a 12 to two week, 12 day to two week, uh, time span. There, there was, Little little time, so it did. Like I said, it just it was more of an instantaneous type thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, if I have the story correct, uh, you go to the doctor and he tells you, you know, look, this is what happened. This is this. You need this done to you if you want, uh, you know, to what what they were telling you at the time was if you want to be able to walk with like the assistance of a cane or a crutch or something, you know, uh, you know, for, for you know, many, many years to come, this is what you need to do. And he's telling you this kind of stuff. And you ask him, uh, when can I fight? When can I be cleared to fight? And the guy looks at you like, what are you talking about fighting? We're, we're trying to get you just back so you can walk. You know, you're, you're still thinking about fighting. Uh, is this a true story? Yeah. Well, we were sitting in Dr. Meyer's office, my neurosurgeon. And after the surgery, those were some of my first questions was how long will it be until I can do this? How long will it be until I can do that? And he flat out looked at me and said, you need to stop all of that right now. He goes, we, we need to just find a way to make sure that you can walk correctly. He says, right now there was so much damage. I don't even know if I can confidently say that you're going to be walking without a walker, um, let alone maybe even without a catheter. So there was a good, there was a, a solid five minute conversation about how I might be using a walker and a catheter for the rest of my life. So, Fighting was light years away in his mind. It wasn't even a thought in his mind. He, he had written that off well before the surgery, I think. Um, and then after he got in there, it wasn't even an idea. It wasn't even a humorous concept. He just wanted to make sure that he could give me the best chance of walking correctly um, for the rest of my life. And that is when the reality really set in, that there is a really real, real version in this scenario where I don't ever fight him very real scenario that I probably wasn't going to fight anymore, let alone walk without having bags sticking out of me. Right, right. Now, at the time, I'm sure you were just focused on getting healthy enough to just continue to live your life, but um, if your career was over at that point, you know, coming off of three losses, you know, you had done a lot of good things uh, earlier in the sport, you know, you, you had the WC title and IFC and, and a bunch of other stuff and beat a bunch of really good guys. Uh, if your career was over then, would have you been okay with that? Um, uh, yes and no. Yes, from the fact that I was happy with what I did with my career, um, no, from the fact that I, I didn't like the idea that I wouldn't, I couldn't be the one to decide when my career ended. I didn't like the idea of having to end my career on somebody else's time frame. Um, and plus, I just felt that there was more I could do. I felt that there was more fight in me. There was more uh, push in me. There was more goal driven. Um, I felt I still had things I could do in the sport that I hadn't had a chance to do yet, and. That was basically my driving factor was I still felt that I, there was stuff I could do. And I'm just one of those guys that I'm not going to, you can't tell me when I'm done, I'll tell me when I'm done kind of type things. And I've just always had one of those mentalities my whole life. So mm-hmm. Now, during this time of you being 
out of action, what are you doing? You know, obviously you're trying to recover and get well again, but job wise, how are you able to pay the rent? Um, I was pretty much on disability at that point. Um, I was living at home with my mom. Um, it was a real dark time. Um, I kind of go over it in the book, but it was really right. dark times for me. Um, I was just living on disability. Um, at one point, uh, the palace, uh, Christian Prina, more so, um, was a good friend out there when I was fighting for him at the palace as well. Um, he called me out to the casino one day. You know, he had uh, he said it had something he wanted to talk to me about because he had seen me outside of the casino, and uh, I walk in and uh, he basically wanted to give me money. Uh, the casino, him in particular, uh, got a, got the casino on board. They basically wanted to give me money to say thanks for doing everything you've done out here at the palace for your career. You've done tons for our organization. You've done tons for the casino. Um, you've been a huge thing when it comes to MMA out here. They, and they knew the kind of spot I was in, and they were just kind of trying to find a way to say thank you because they knew I was in a hard spot, and they saw an opportunity to help me in return. So they took that. So, you know, it was it was really the generosity and the kindness of people like Christian in the palace. Um, but, so, you know, my mom being as supportive as she was, um, you know, just close family and friends and stuff. Yes, you know, I made it through, but um, it was definitely a really, really rough patch in my life because, like you said, I wasn't working. I couldn't really do much. Um, I couldn't even stand up, really. And there was not really much I could do as far as work went. So I was really, really in the dumps uh, pretty much at that part of my life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, you returned to action in May of 2009. Uh, so when you get the surgery, how long does it take for you to, to recover? And then when do you start training after you, you go to the doctor and they give you a, a clean bill of health? What, what's the timeline for that? Um, it took about a good, a little over a year before I could even walk on my own without the use of a walker and things like that. Um, it would be about another two years uh, before I could actually, before me and my coach agreed that, yeah, I, I, I can do this again because I took a job teaching MMA at a gym for a while and I, I couldn't really do much with the students except show the moves, talk them through it, walk them through it. I couldn't really be as hands-on as, as I would have liked to. And it took a couple of years before I got to the point where I could actually be more hands-on. Um, I actually think doing that job kind of helped push me uh, mentally and physically into, into being where I got to as far as able to fight again because it was a real... It was, a, it was a MMA teaching job, so I had to force myself to get in there and show them the moves and, and, and be hands-on as much as I could. So the drive, I think, to be a better teacher helped me in, that, in the sense that, you know, I could get back into fighting and training because it, it, it mentally forced me to push myself to do more than I think I might have allowed myself to think I was capable of. So I kind of had to push myself and talk myself into it. But uh, it was about a good year and a half before I could walk right, and then another year and a half to two years before I could do anything fight-related, uh, confidently at least. Mm -hmm. When you returned to the sport, you went on a five-fight win streak, uh, which shocked a lot of people. A lot of people thought that you would never fight again. A lot of people thought you would never walk again. A lot of people were completely shocked that this was happening and you were doing so well. Realistically, when you when you came back and when you defeated Michael McDonald at W or excuse me PFC thirteen um, May of two thousand nine, uh, realistically, what what did you think was going to happen? Did you think you were going to be able to put together this kind of run, or did you think that you know it would it would have been you know kind of you know a good run but not what you were able to do you know realistically what were what were your um what were your thoughts on what was going to happen when you finally came back uh i'll be honest none of us none of us really knew um to this day thursdays where i'll go to the gym and work out and my legs will just start shaking uh it just did happen so about the permanent side effects from, from the from the surgery and stuff and being paralyzed, um, those little things like that that always put down in our head that I would be able to do it. Um, none of us really had a goal. None of us really had an idea. We didn't know what to expect. Um, none of us had ever experienced anything like this before. Um, nobody in MMA had ever experienced anything like this before. So it was a real uh, it was a real new new ground, new area that we were trekking on. Um, like I said, none of us really knew what to expect. We didn't really have high expectations, but we didn't really have low expectations either. We just wanted to go out there and, and do what we could, the best we could, and see what would happen. Um, 
I, I thought I could do better. I felt like I was in a better place training wise. I felt stronger. I felt happier about what I was doing. Um, I felt more engaged in the sport. Uh, I felt that I could do stuff, but at the same time, I didn't know because this was all uncharted water. Nobody had ever experienced this before. So we didn't really know what to think. We didn't really have expectations, I guess you could call it. We just had hopes that I would not, basically that my legs would still work even during my first fight. That was our biggest goal and our biggest hurdle was we just want to make sure his legs work for the first fight. We'll worry about what happens after, after the fight's over and we'll go from there kind of thing. So, mm. I see, I see. Now, in that five-fight win streak, you captured the uh, TPF Bantamweight Championship um, in February 2010. But the fight I want to talk about is the uh, Yoshihiro Maeda fight, Dream 13. You KO'd him with a a beautiful head kick, a great combination, right low kick and then left high kick. uh, Knocked him out. Uh, He was out before he he hit the ground. But when you went in to put the finishing touches on it, you did kind of like a body slam on him because you... Uh, the referee cut you off before you could mount him and then uh, finish with punches. Um, that was a big opportunity for you because, you know, you had only fought, I think, maybe four or five times, I want to say, outside of the state of California. And this was the first time you were ever fighting outside of the country. And uh, You were fighting in Japan, which is a very big deal. And at the time, Dream was a, a very big organization. Um, what are your memories about that fight? And what are your memories about that experience? And, and how much did it mean to you to finally be in Japan fighting? Um, it was huge. I mean, it was a huge opportunity to be fighting in Japan. Um, the whole trip itself was one of the, like I said, one of the top five experiences of my life. Um, it was just, it was surreal. It was, I'd never been to another country. Um, just seeing the city was different, the people, the interactions. Um, it kind of sucked knowing that the whole reason you were there was to lose. Right. Because that's just how those organizations work. They bring American fighters over to lose. That's just it's just the way it is. They don't bring you over there to beat their guys. They bring you over there to look good losing to their guys mm-hmm. is essentially how they mark their fighters. So um, it was uh, a little tense. You know, I was nervous. I'd never been there before. Um, I kind of felt me and my coach were kind of by ourselves there. I didn't really know any of the other American fighters in the cards. So I didn't really get to hang out with anyone. Um, it was fun. I mean, there's, there's so much about Tokyo and the experience and the way they do their interviews and, how they interact with the fighters, how the fans interact with the fighters is surreal. I mean, it took me 45 minutes just to get from the ring backstage after the fight. So, because people just want to, they want to take a picture with you. They want to touch you. Um, that's a big thing over in Japan. They just want to touch you. Mm-hmm. I had a lady stick her kid over the railing. Kid couldn't have been more than like three or four years old. Right. She stuck him over the railing just so I could like high five him. I mean, it's just, it's surreal. And then they'll take photos of you and, then you get on the bus to head back to the hotel, and the people that took the photos of you have already went and got the film developed, and they're waiting at the hotel there for you to sign the picture of you with him that they just took. So it was real. It was a real surreal experience, but it was fun. Um, I'd go back to Japan any chance I got, but it was just it, it was a really good time. I'm glad I did it. It was an opportunity, and uh, that's why I jumped on the second opportunity to go fight Mashiro. But it was a great win. Um, it was definitely an unexpected win because. About, I'd say, two, three minutes in, I was getting cracked pretty hard, right. and I realistically just did not have an answer for Yashiro as far as his striking, because he was kind of just picking me apart. Um, I think my height worked to his advantage, because he could get lower and sneak into those uppercuts up the middle a lot easier on me than he would somebody his own size. So I felt that he, would, he had the advantage striking for sure. Um, but I just, you know, I got lucky. I, I do that inside leg kick to break their balance, and then I follow with a head kick all the time in the gym. Like I said, I, I love the head kick. You know, I do it all the time in the gym, and kind of the opening there. And uh, the, the thing at the end with the diving on him, you know, that, that uh, Dan Henderson did that to right. uh, what, Michael Bisping one yep. time. Yep. I did it before he did it, so I kind of like, I, I kind of like to think I started that. But, um, yeah, it was... Uh, got to be one of the biggest wins in my career by far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that that combination, the right low kick and left high kick. I uh, I do that all the time to my buddies in uh, the UFC video game. I always do that, and they always say, that's that's not really going to happen in real life. That can't happen. And then we watch your fight, and I'm like, well, that's where I found out about it. It was this fight. He, he <laughs> throws the low kick and then comes back up with the high kick. Um, I'm just curious... Um, when you when you landed that, did you know that you you caught him in the right spot? Because the the 
bottom of your foot actually catches him on the chin and, and puts him down. Did, did you know that you, you had landed clean with that? Yeah, as soon as I saw him go back, I saw how his arms went stiff and his body went stiff when he went back. I pretty much knew that was it. Mm-hmm. Um, the follow-up dive, I was trying to land another punch on him because the way the way my coach trained us and our fighters is until the referee stops you, you don't stop. That was just the way it was. And until the ref is pulling you off of him or yanking on you to let go, you don't stop just because we don't want to, I don't want to be that guy that lets a fighter get a second chance and ends up knocking me out. So it's, it's you go for the kill no matter what, and I just happened to land land my fist. You watch it again, I land my fist right on his jaw, mm-hmm. and uh, I think that I think I broke his jaw at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but I landed before the ref could get to me, and it's just, I, I, you know, I, I'm looking back on it, I kind of feel bad because he's obviously unconscious the second he connects with that kick. His right. arms go stiff right. and he just goes back. Right. So I, I feel bad in that sense because he was obviously unconscious, but at the same time, uh, I didn't want to be the guy that stood there and let him get back up, mm-hmm. and then the fight's going, and that might have been my one and only opportunity to finish the fight. So mm-hmm. it's basically why I did it. Um, but yeah, I, as soon as I connected with that, I pretty much knew he was out. Mm-hmm. I think the best part about that fight is after you finish him, they do like a crowd scan and they show uh, Hiro Takaro and then they show uh, Haruki Takaya in the in the crowd. They do a crowd scan and their the look on the look of horror on their faces of what had happened is priceless. Uh, have you seen this the, the video of this oh, yeah. and see them? Yeah, yeah, I saw the I saw a couple of YouTube videos where they pan the crowd. Right, there's a couple of guys that they don't look very happy either. They they look pretty pissed, but uh, yeah, they all had a real look of shock because like I said. They don't, they don't bring American fighters out there to win. They bring you out there to look good losing to their guys. So I, especially the way the fight had been going already, I don't think anybody expected that. Uh, especially the inside. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And those guys are all in the same weight class as you, so they're looking around like, I hope I, hope I don't get this guy next. It, it's crazy. Yeah. It was, yeah, it's, I'm sure they were all hoping they got me before, and yeah. then they all saw that, and they were like, oops, never mind. Yeah, yeah, that, that's great. That that's my favorite part of the fight. I mean, the knockout itself is is great, but then you you do that crowd scan, and and that's just a, a hat tip to the the HD Net production team for capturing that because that's just oh, yeah. amazing. There, the look on their faces, I, I I I I close my eyes and I can see it all the time. It's just crazy. It's great. Now, after that fight, uh, you you fought Michael McDonald in a rematch. Uh, he took the TPF belt from you. And then after that, you returned to Japan. You fought uh, Mishihiro Umigawa at Dream 16. You you lost uh, that fight by armbar, inverted armbar, actually. And then you picked up a win against Steven Seiler in, in Utah. You submitted him with, uh, what else, a, a triangle choke. You submitted him uh, in, in J- January 2011. Um, as a whole, in that run, uh, you went 6-2, and two, and then you made the jump to the UFC. After that uh, Siler fight, you were, you were really campaigning hard to get on the Ultimate Fighter. And there were some things, I think it was financial reasons or something along those lines, that prevented you from going to the tryouts in New Jersey. And then you you try to get the fans on board, try to rally behind you to get you on that show. Uh, I'm just curious, um, why didn't that work? What did Sean Shelby or Dana White or someone from the production team, like what reasons were you given on why uh, you couldn't be a part of that show? Um, I don't remember ever really being given any real reason for it. Um... Uh, I think the UFC will always stand by their marquee of, you know, you have to win fights and be popular to, to be invited for things like that. But I don't know. I mean, I think I was just frustrated because at that time, it seems all you have to do is fight me and you went to the UFC. Uh, McDonald fought me, he went to the UFC. Omegawa fought me, he went to the UFC. Tyler fought me and lost, and he went to the ultimate fighter. So right. I was at that point to where I was like, this is kind of bullshit. It seems like everybody I fight gets to go to UFC but me. And I was kind of, I was a little frustrated about that. So, um, but I kind of took it as a compliment, too, because it said, you know, here's a guy, if you fight him and beat him, you're good enough to go to the UFC. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I took it as a compliment at the same time, but it was still uber frustrating. Um, I never really got a reason, and I don't think I really ever expected a reason. I just, I wanted to make waves, and I went about making waves, and that's how you get attention. So, I went and made waves, and uh, sure, sure, I got the UFC's attention because Sean Shelby called me one day. And he was none too happy. So I definitely got their attention, um, but I pretty much just got their attention in the wrong way. You know what I mean? I, I, I could have went kind of a lot of different ways 
And uh, Sean, me and Sean had a long talk and, you know, discussed some things and basically got on the same page. And he was like, look, you know, I, I want you in. I want you here and stuff, but you got to, you know, you got to give us some wins. You got to do this. You got to do that. Um, you know, you can't go about it this way. You're, you're, you're hurting yourself by doing it this way. And he just basically took his time, not as UFC employee, but just as, as, as Sean, to just talk to Cole and say, hey, dude, here's, here's the things you need to do. Here's what you're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what you should be doing. You know, this is how the game works. Mm -hmm. And so he just, you know, basically took his time to kind of help educate me more on, on how it works. Again, from an entertainment business standpoint, you know, how to make friends, how to make enemies, things like that, the like do's and the don'ts of the sport. And uh, he just kind of helped me out, and, you know, and I, I appreciate it, and I kind of took it into consideration and tried to change my outlook on it. And then, you know, not too long after that, I sure got a phone call from Sean again saying, mm -hmm. hey, you know, you don't want to fight uh, you want to fight Burrell, you know. Right. It, we'll get you in the UFC. If you want it in, this is in, is mm -hmm. basically what he told me. Right. Um, you, know, you said you want it in, this is it. You want in, here's the, here's the guy. But the guy was like 28 now, and I was like, oh, that sucks. Right. And he was, he was like, I'm not going to lie, it's, it's a tough kid. Uh, there's a good chance you're probably going to lose. This guy's just a beast. But it's the only fight we have, and we need an opponent for him, and your name came up. So I said, yeah. So I took it. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, you only got one way in, and that was my way in, I guess. Mm -hmm. You filled in for Brad Pickett on that card. He was supposed to fight Barrow, and then when he went down or, or something happened, I, I can't remember the exact situation, yeah. but uh, they came to you and, and offered you the fight. I'm just curious, a lot of people were surprised because nowadays it seems like once you lose a fight on the regional circuit and, and have to rebuild, uh, it, you know, it doesn't really count for much uh, what you did before that loss and then after that is what they kind of look at. So you had two losses and then you beat Steven Seiler and it was, it was a weird situation because they didn't want you on the Ultimate Fighter but then they wanted you to fight Barrow. Were you surprised when they came calling to you? Because some people were when they put you in against Barrow. Yeah, I, I'll be honest, I, I don't really, uh, I couldn't really argue with the naysayers who probably thought I wasn't qualified for that, to be offered that fight. Uh, I think they were in a pinch, I think they needed somebody that was a known name, somebody that at least they can sell, that they tried to market a proper opponent for them. Um, plus, I think they just kind of realized I was a self-marketer, they realized that I kind of went out of my way to make waves and and get my name out there and, and want people to know who I was. And they have a huge marketing machine within the UFC. I mean, it's huge. That's one of the other things that you get as being a UFC fighter is you're allowed to this huge marketing machine to brand yourself and get your name out there and promote yourself as much as humanly possible. So they thought that the way I was as far as my self-marketing, I thought that then maybe they could use that you know, within that machine, and they thought it would be a good combo. And I already had a name, even though I hadn't been on, you know, a good regional street. I still had a name, and they knew people would recognize the name. And I think I'd been bugging them so much that they were like, look, just give the kid a fight. Let's just have a route beat his ass and be done with him. Mm -hmm. So there was probably a little bit of all, all of that kind, kind of combined into that Super Bowl. But um, they just, they had an opening. They needed a fighter, and I just happened to be at the right place at the right time, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, all the time people talk about, oh, there's no f easy fights in the UFC. Every fight in the UFC is tough. And your run in the UFC, the three fighters that you fought there, backs up that statement. Um, oh, hell yeah. What, what went wrong for you during that time? Because obviously people can say, oh, well, look at who he fought. You know, these guys are all great. You know, that's why he lost. But at the same time, they fought you. And, and they, if you would have beat them, they could have said the same thing about you. So what went wrong for you during your UFC run? Um, I think you can make an argument for the Burrell fight. I think the only reason he won that fight is on takedowns. Um, I dropped him in the second round to his knees, and I think I had a missed opportunity to land another knee and finish him off. So I, I, I strongly feel that the argument could have been made. I probably could have won that fight on decision. I could have gone either way. Um, the Mizugaki fight, um, my clinch came just with what it should have been, and he took advantage of that and put a pummeling on me. Um, in my defense, though, he, he did have to put me down twice for the stop the fight. So, um, that was a good one. Uh, Mike Tracking just wasn't on par for that one. And the Karis Harris fight, I'll be honest, I, and I hate to say it, man, I just didn't go up for work that day. Um, again, none of these guys, with the exception of like Mizugaki, they, nobody's really ever finished me. I think I've only been finished, like, you know, I think twice in my career. And, for Bruce Leroy to do all that fancy stuff and all, all this flashing moves and stuff, and he still couldn't put me away. I just didn't show up for work. I had, I cut more weight than I should have. I was just horrible at weight cut. 
Um, it, that was just draining on my, you know, my energy level. But it didn't show up for work. I, I mentally uh, just didn't show up. And, you know, I had nobody else to blame but myself. I felt really bad. You know, I tried to apologize to, to Sean and those guys because I don't feel that I put on as good of a show as I could have. Um, even in between rounds, when you're listening to the corner and talk, you can hear my coach. And he's like, dude, you're making him look like a superstar. What are you doing in there? We need to, let's go. Let's get on the game plan. And I just, I, I just basically walked around the ring the whole time and didn't, didn't do anything. Um, I, I just, I screwed that one up. You know, I just had nobody to blame but myself on that one. I just didn't show up for work that day. But uh, they were all really tough opponents. Then to get a guy like Burrell for your first UFC fight is no easy task. And then, you know, they, they did me a favor by giving me another fight, but they didn't really do me a favor, by, you know, giving me the guy. So um, it was good. It was a good, you know, it, it, was, it was a good thing to do because I felt at least I could look back on the time I was able to spend in the UFC and everybody I fought, somebody who's a fan knows exactly who that guy is. Mm -hmm. You could say, oh, well, who'd you fight? Oh, I fought Mr. Gawk, and they go, oh, I know who that guy is, as opposed to fighting um, some other prelim guy that nobody's ever heard of and losing and being a, a, a phantom in the UFC. You know, so it, with that, I kind of take solace in knowing that, that at least I fought guys that everybody knows who they are, so... Even in loss, you know, people can still look back and say, oh, dude, you know, I know all the guys call fine. Those were no easy opponents, so... Mm -hmm. uh, Cole, a couple more questions, and I really appreciate you being so liberal with your time. I know this has been a very, very long interview, but uh, a couple more questions here. Um, now, not in terms of, of name value and, and what they've done in this sport, but when actually you stepped in the cage and fought them, who's the best guy that you ever fought, and also who's the toughest guy you ever fought? That's a good question. Um, um, yeah, that's a good question. I would say um, McDonald was probably one of the more technical strikers that I fought as far as as soon as I saw his, his technique on his striking when he landed and stuff, I knew that uh, it was going to be a striking fight. Um, as far as toughest, Jiminy Christmas, that's a good one. Um, I have to say maybe... Watch would probably be one of the toughest guys because we sat there and just beat on each other for two straight rounds. We were just trading solid punch for solid punch. So, off the top of my head, I have to say Quash was probably the toughest opponent I fought who just wouldn't go down. Uh, and then probably the best as far as technicality, striking wise, and technique and stuff. At least then, at that point in my career, probably would have been McDonald. And that was off the rematch fight with him. Because he was just on his game on that one. I mean, he came to play on that day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there a fighter in your career that you were like, you know what, going into the fight, I should just r completely roll over this guy. I should just dominate him in every aspect of the game. And then when you got in there, you're like, man, this guy's really good. This guy's way tougher than I thought. And then on the flip side, was there a guy who you're like, man, this guy's going to be really tough. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. i got to be ready for it. And then when you got in there, you're like, I, I worried myself over nothing. Uh, were there any kind of guys like that? Um, No, and that's kind of just because I'm I'm – I'm, I'm really arrogant a lot of times in, the, in the MMA and in my life, but I'm pretty humble in the fact that I never went into a fight thinking this is going to be an easy fight. I'm just going to roll over this guy. And he ended up being tough, and I was shocked. Uh, I've, never, I've never once gone into a fight thinking this is going to be an easy fight. And my coach used to tell me every fight's an easy fight if you stick to the game plan and you show up and you do your job. As long as you do that, every fight can be an easy fight. It's, it's when the game plan, it's when you don't stick to the game plan, you don't commit to the fight, you don't commit to the moment, that's when it becomes a hard fight. So every opponent we always felt was a dangerous opponent because otherwise they wouldn't be a fighter. They're still a fighter. They're, they're, there's something, something wrong with us upstairs where we're okay with getting into a ring and fighting for money. So every opponent's a dangerous opponent. It's just a matter of, how how fast you beat them and how easy you beat them is just a resemblance of, of the, the rules. And you follow the rules of sticking to the game plan, being aggressive, and doing your job. So I can't really say there was ever an opponent that I felt I was just going to walk over and turn out to be a tough fight. I, I took every opponent as the potential to be um, a tough career-ending fighter. I just I had to look at them because otherwise I didn't respect them. If I didn't respect them, I wouldn't show them for work and do my job, basically, is how I approach that. Um, and as far as tough guys, I thought they were all going to be tough. We all 
we all came up with game plans to fit everything we felt an opponent was dangerous with. Um, we trained everything we could to try to counter any of their strengths and work on my weaknesses to make sure they weren't weaknesses going into the fight. Um, there, there was never really a, an opponent where uh, afterwards I thought, oh, that was really easy. No, because they're all, they're all tough opponents. Even if I just, and this is going to sound hilarious, even if I just made it look easy, every, every opponent was dangerous, and I always felt that there's always a chance I can lose the fight unless I do my job and stick to the game plan and just keep the pedal to the floor and stay on them. Otherwise, I'm going to give them an opportunity to find a way to win. Mm -hmm. that, that's what fights are, is, is a series of different opportunities for each opponent um, to either win the fight or lose the fight, and it's just a matter of who takes possession of that opportunity first. Mm -hmm. Now, I think I have a pretty good idea of what your answer is going to be, but I'm just curious, what do you consider the greatest moment of your career? Uh, that's, that's easily the first McDonald fight. Mm -hmm. I thought so. It was, my, it was my first fight after being paralyzed. There was probably more riding in that one fight than any, any other fight in my career ever because that was going to tell us right then and there whether or not I actually had a chance to keep fighting or if I was done and I was going to have to walk away from fighting forever. That was the fight that defined whether or not I was going to go any farther or be done with fighting. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just curious, what do you consider the worst moment of your career? Um, the worst moment of my career... I have to say I've never been more disappointed with myself with the exception of the Caraceras fight, the Bruce Lee Red fight. Like I said, I just didn't show up for work that day, and I was so disappointed in myself because I had taken a perfectly good opportunity with a perfectly good opponent like Alex Caraceras, who is a very game opponent. He's flashy. He's flamboyant. Um, he would have been a good opponent to win against, and I kind of felt the UFC was kind of just not giving me the win, but uh, giving me the opportunity to get a win. Again, the opportunity falls onto me, and it's my responsibility, and I just didn't see that opportunity to win that fight because I honestly feel that I can beat Bruce Lee Roy, and if I were to fight again, I, I feel I could, I could beat him. I felt I should have beat him the first fight if I just, you know, got off my ass and did my job and shown up for work that day. But um, I would say that is probably the lowest in my career as far as disappointment because I had a golden opportunity to get a win, my first win in the UFC, and move on and do great things, and I just blew it. I, I squandered an opportunity, and I didn't take full advantage of it. I would say that's probably the bottom, the lowest part of my career because I have nobody to blame but myself, and it was a golden opportunity that the UFC gave me, and I screwed it up and I blew it, mm -hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in this interview, I think you said Caceres and Faber are the two guys that you want to have a rematch with the most. I think that's what you said. Um, besides rematches, like let's say a fight that or a fighter out there that you never got a chance to fight, whether it was a fight that you guys just never crossed paths or it was a fight that was supposed to happen and got canceled due to injury or, or whatever, um, who's the fighter out there or, or fighters? Maybe it's a couple guys that you never got the chance to fight but would have loved to have fought over your career. Um, well, there was always talk of me and Jeff Corinne getting a fight together, and we, just between us, we would have loved to have seen that, because back in our, our primes, that would have been a really fun fight to watch, I think. Um, we're buddies now, and we've always been buddies, but we always thought that would have been a good fight. Um, there's one fighter, and I, for the love of God, I can't remember his name, because that's how pissed off I was. I, I totally didn't want to remember him. It was a fight in a WEC event at Connecticut in Mohegan Sun. It was like the only event that the, the WEC ever did outside of the palace uh, before UFC bought them out. And I was scheduled to fight on that card, and I was turning 21 years old the day of lands. So I couldn't drink, I couldn't park, fun. So I basically missed my 21st birthday because I was at lands for the fight. And then the next day I got a phone call from Reed that uh, the fight was canceled. The guy had uh, some, something came back in his blood work and the athletic commission wouldn't let him fight. So my fight, my fight got canceled because it was literally last second. They had no replacement for me, nothing. So basically I wasted my 21st birthday. I missed it and I didn't even get to fight on top of it. So it was kind of a double whammy because I didn't get a fight. I still got my show money. Um, I think I even got my win money on that particular car because they were so apologetic for the for the problem. 
Um, I think they paid me my, part of my win money at least. But back then, guys like Reed and the WC, they always took care of me, so I wasn't really worried about it. Um, but yeah, I was, I was kind of pissed because I didn't get to fight, and I didn't even get to enjoy my 21st birthday. And I got jacked out of something that only comes around once in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So people say, oh, but your next day, you were 21, you got to drink. I was like, yeah, but you don't, you don't get to experience your 21st birthday more than one time. That's it. There's right. one. You get one. That's it. So I kind of felt robbed out of that. So if I could go back and fight one guy, it would have been that guy I was going to fight on that card um, just because I felt I got robbed of two things that night, a fight and my birthday celebration. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that whole event ended up being real fun because I ended up getting drunk and sitting in Chuck Liddell's seats ringside and getting kicked out by Chuck and the tap out guys. <laughs> um, and then I ended up getting kicked out of the bar because there was a bar fight. It was a pretty experience, uh, entertaining experience to say the least, but... That would be the one thing, if I could find anybody, it would be that guy. Right, right. Now, with your future in fighting kind of being up in the air, you, you might come back, you might not come back. Um, is there a fight out there now? I mean, you mentioned this guy who, who we don't know. We don't even know if he's still fighting. And then the, the other guy, Jeff Curran, he's he's kind of in the same boat you are. He's, he's kind of retired but, but on the fence about coming back. Um, is there a guy out there right now that if it can be put together that you'd be like, you know what, I'm going to come out of retirement and, and fight this guy? Is there anybody that you can think of now? Um, nobody in particular. A guy like Jeff Coran, I would definitely have to establish myself and get a couple fights and get some W's in and, and make sure I'm back on par before I ever considered fighting a guy like Jeff. You can't just go off the wagon and then fight a guy like Jeff Coran unless you want to have your ass handed to you. That's just the reality of it is because that guy is, till the day he dies, that guy's going to be uh, just a beast and a warrior. That, that guy, I swear to God, that guy had the problem of being born in the wrong century because that guy was highly underrated, and people still don't don't give him the kind of credit and respect he deserves because he was one of the pioneers of our weight classes. And a lot of people, your casual fans, they don't know that and they don't they don't realize that. So I would have to get a couple solid wins in first, get some momentum going, get my feet wet, get, get comfortable again, and then I can move forward from there. But um, if, if down the road, you know, and my career continued and, and the fight came up, yeah, I'd love an opportunity to fight a guy like Jeff because he's a great guy. He'd be a great opponent to have on your resume. Win or lose, he'd be a great guy to have on your resume of, of guys you got to experience a fight with. Because at the end of the day, it's still a sport, and you get to sit back and have beers with him and still be like, dude, we had a really good fight, and then not hate each other after. I think that's got to be some of the best things about MMA is you can fight a guy, beat the dog crap out of each other, and then after, have fun. Be friends. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a job. Um, when I fought Jeff Bedard, uh, out of the palace. Afterwards, his team, uh, I think they jumped the bus and went back to a plane and headed home. None of them hung out with him after. And one of the worst things you can do after a loss is be by yourself, especially when your teammates aren't there. So we kind of found, we, we heard about this and found out. We went and grabbed this. and said, hey, dude, where's your buddies? And it's like, oh, they took off. They went back to the hotel or whatever. And they're like, dude, so you're by yourself. And you're like, yeah, I'm just I'm bummed out. I'm hanging out. We're like, dude, okay, this is going to sound hella awkward, but come hang out with us, come drink with us, come party with us, because no fighter should be alone at an after party, first off. Nobody should be hanging out by themselves. And B, somebody who just lost definitely shouldn't be by themselves. They, they need to be around people. So come hang out with us. Come have fun with me and my team. Come hang out. Be part of our team. Don't, don't hang out by yourself. So there's always a camaraderie um, as far as that goes. So it's always give and take, you know, it, you got to look at it from that point of view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, is the Michael McDonald fight the fight that you would show, like, let's say in 30 or 40 years, your grandkids, like if they ever came up to you and said, you know what, Grandpa, show me one of your fights. What's the first fight that you would show them? Would it be the McDonald fight or would it be another fight that you would show them? If you could only show them one, like they just want to watch one, uh, what would be the fight? you would show them? Would it be the McDonald one, the first one against Michael McDonald, or is it another one that you'd put in? Um, I would probably show them, it would be a toss-up between probably the Burrell fight or the Maeda fight. That would be one of the two fights I would show them. Just because it showed them how awesome the sport was and just how cool Grandpa is, first <laughs> off. It shows how cool Grandpa is. But um, I, I think both those fights give them a full perspective of A, how uh, technical and and how grinding the sport can be, and then B, how ultimately dangerous the sport can be. Because even after the Yashiro Maeda fight, all I could think of was, if I'm physically capable of doing that type of damage to somebody, 
somebody could do that to me. And that always became a fear in my head because if I could do it to someone, someone could do it to me. And then McDonald did it to me not too long later where he knocked me out on my feet. And I watched that fight and it, it's, I've only watched that fight one time. I just, I won't let myself watch anymore because it's a bad scene, man. I'm, I'm knocked out on my feet and my feet just don't give way, and he just sits there and just cracks on me like a good four or five more times, and I'm already unconscious. I'm totally unconscious. I have no idea what's going on, and it's just, it's, 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 a, it's a dirty thing to watch, man. It's a bad thing to watch, so I know both ends of the spectrum, so I would try to give them one of those two types to give them a fuller understanding of this is how cool and exciting the sport can be, and then this is how technical the sport can be. You know, I want to give them both, uh, both spectrums. Hmm, I see, I see. Cool, last question before I let you go. In, let's say, 30, 40 years, let's go with that timeline again. Um, let's say I'm, I'm walking down the street and somebody asks me, uh, Co Escovito, uh, what, what do you know about him? You know, was he a good fighter? You know, what, what can you tell about him? Um, you know, legacy wise, memory wise, if someone comes up to me and asks me about you, what should I tell them? What do you want me to tell them if, if somebody 30 or 40 years comes up to me and asks me about you? I, I honestly, the one thing I would want to walk away from anything leading a sport is that people felt I gave everything I could to the sport and that I tried to stay as humble about it as possible. Um, that would be just one of the few things I would hope anybody would take away from this as far as my legacy is. They look back on it and go, Cole was always humble. He showed up. He did his job. That's all he wanted to do. It. He didn't care about being famous. He didn't care about being rich. He just wanted to support his family and do his job. And um, that I, I, I was uh, almost like a leader in a sense that I, I, I inspired people. You know, I just want to be remembered as inspiring as a, and, a, and as, as a humble fighter. That, that's basically the, I think the only thing that I'd ever want to take away from that sport would be the image to leave. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely, uh, Cole. This was fun. I, I was, I was uh, wondering where you'd been. You know, you haven't fought in a long time. I was wondering how you were doing, and I'm, I'm glad you're doing well. I'm glad you got uh, some things going in your life. Uh, I'm glad that we were able to take this walk down memory lane. You had a, a fine career. You accomplished a lot in this sport. So, uh, I really appreciate your time. And uh, no, Mike, by all means, I appreciate your time and, and, and taking your time to see and listen to me babble for the last you know hour and a half. And I, I really appreciate it because. It's a lot of people just come up with the same mundane questions, and I can answer the same question a thousand times in a week. Um, it, it's good to actually be able to talk to somebody and, and have a good interview type conversation and be able to get some real answers out and have some real questions for a change and be able to give some sincere answers and, and actually be able to look back and, and, and think about some of the stuff that I've actually done in my career and look and actually get to think about it to. to to formulate an answer and get to enjoy those memories again so, so thank you i appreciate that mm-hmm. definitely definitely and uh once again the book uh dropping august tentatively um will that be available on like you know kindle and and stuff like that all those I tablets think we're shooting, i think we're shooting for amazon i think is what the, the first directive uh is going to be for the book um you can actually if you want to actually hit up zach robinson he's on my facebook page uh as far as my friends list. if you want to just hit him up directly he can give you all the specifics on it, um, where exactly it'll be released, when it should be released, how you can find it, and any of the pedigree information like that. He's the man when it comes to that. He's been so helpful with this book, and he's been so so good about uh, being on the ball and, and keeping us informed and stuff and taking our, our opinions into it as he writes it and stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, people, the book is Through the Cage Door, the life story of Cole Escobedo covering uh, his life basically up till, up until now. Uh, it, it's... Uh, book that i'm really looking forward to i'm definitely going to pick this one up uh you know i i got a real good sense of, of who you are uh, now but I, I need to get the full version and i wanted to stay away from some things because i know they're going to be in the book so i can't wait uh for august uh so i can get my hands on this thing so cole really appreciate you taking the time to talk and uh best of luck uh in future endeavors maybe you're coming back to fighting maybe you're not but um regardless uh, a great career and uh thank you for, for your time today thank you appreciate it mike